Good evening, everybody. Good evening, everybody. Hello. Welcome. Um, welcome to the MLK Week keynote address on creative nonviolence. My name is Adam, and I work for InterVarsity Christian Fellowship here on campus. And I was told that I could take a few minutes to shamelessly plug. Can't hear me. Now, can you hear me? Okay. This is weird. I need to stand bent over. Um, I was told I could take a few minutes. Um, to explain what InterVarsity is and why we're here on campus and why we are partnering with this event. So InterVarsity Christian Fellowship likes to ask big questions about, um, is Jesus relevant to my life? Big questions of faith, things like that. Um, and we actually believe in doing things. So that's why we're partnering with this event. That's why we feel creative nonviolence is an important thing um, in the message of Jesus, among other things. So one thing that we do is we take a trip down to New Orleans on spring break. So if there's any students here that have nothing to do on spring break, or if you have something to do like go to Cancun and you know, you're know you really kind of sick of going to Cancun every year, and you want to come with us to New Orleans, talk to me right after the, um, the keynote address tonight. I can give you some details. It's really cheap and it's a lot of fun. There's a group of people right over there that have all gone before, and they will tell you that it's awesome. Um, so that was my shameless plug for InterVarsity. Um, so without... Uh, stalling anymore. I want to welcome up Paul De Mesquita, professor of psychology and the director of the Center of Nonviolence here on campus, and he's going to welcome up our guest speaker for tonight. So, Paul. Welcome, everybody. Hello, everybody. <laughs> you, you better get ready for a really uh, dynamic and inspirational uh, talk by uh, Father John Deere uh, tonight. Um, <clears throat> we're, very, we're very blessed and, and honored to have uh, John Deere here, particularly on this uh, annual celebration of the uh, university's Martin Luther King Week. Um, the Multicultural Center uh, InterVarsity Origins and the Center for Nonviolence and Peace Studies are so delighted to have uh, someone such as Father John Deere with us tonight. He's been on our campus speaking at our uh, Unity Luncheon earlier today and uh, being on our campus has been quite special. Because we are all in favor of nonviolence and we are all in favor of peace, but few of us really walk the sometimes dangerous and courageous path to nonviolence. And we are so fortunate to have luminaries, leaders, and visionaries among us in each of the decades and the eras throughout history who have demonstrated not just the idea of peace or the idea of nonviolence, but who have actually stood up to enact what nonviolence is. And John Deere is certainly in that category. John is a Jesuit priest, a peace activist, an organizer, an author, a lecturer. He has written over 25 books on peace, justice, and nonviolence. And I would encourage all of you before you leave to, uh, to take some time to peruse some of the works that he's brought with him. Uh, and uh, perhaps uh, there's an opportunity for you to, uh, you know, engage with him at the end of uh, his talk. From 1998 until December 2000, he served as the executive director of the Fellowship of Reconciliation. The Fellowship of Reconciliation is one of the world's largest interfaith peace organizations. From 2002 to 2004, he served as pastor of several parishes in northeastern New Mexico. Currently, he coordinates Pax Christi, New Mexico. He lectures to literally tens of thousands of people each year across the country. After September 11th in 2001, those attacks and tragedies involving the collapse of the World Trade Center, so many leave, losing their lives, Father Deere began volunteering as a Red Cross chaplain. He became one of the coordinators of the whole chaplain program supporting victims and families. He worked with some 1,500 family members who had lost loved ones, as well as hundreds of firefighters 
and police officers. But at the same time, and just as important, he was a spokesperson speaking out against war and the U.S. bombing of Afghanistan. A longtime practitioner and teacher of nonviolence, John Deere has written hundreds of articles and gives talks regularly around the country and around the world. His work for peace has taken him to places such as El Salvador, where he lived and worked in a refugee camp in the mid-80s, to Guatemala, Nicaragua, Haiti, the Middle East, the Philippines, to Northern Ireland, where he lived and worked as, at a human rights center for a year, to Iraq, where he led a delegation of Nobel Peace Prize winners to witness the effects of the deadly violent sanctions on Iraqi children. He has run a shelter for the homeless in Washington. He served as executive director of Sacred Heart Center, a community center for disenfranchised women and children in Virginia. A native of North Carolina, Father Deer was arrested on December 7, 1993 at the Seymour Johnson Air Force Base in Goldsboro, North Carolina for joining a small group of courageous nonviolence activists who were hammering on F-15 nuclear fighter bombers, risking their lives in this dramatic action of civil disobedience in an effort to literally beat swords into plowshares. Along with activist Phil Berrigan, he spent eight months in North Carolina jails. Deere has been arrested over 75 times in acts of nonviolent civil disobedience for peace. He's organized hundreds of demonstrations against war, nuclear weapons, at military bases across the country, as well as worked with Mother Teresa and others to put an end to the death penalty and executions. He holds two master's degrees in theology from Graduate Theological Union in California. And in 2008, he was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize with the support of Archbishop Desmond Tutu. In his nomination, it included these statements. Father John Deere is a Jesuit priest who's been in the forefront of the peace movement in the United States. He's the embodiment of a peacemaker. He is led by examples through his actions and in his writings and numerous talks, sermons, speeches, and demonstrations. He believes that peace is not something static, but rather to make peace is to be actively engaged, mind, body, and spirit. His teaching is to love yourself, love your neighbor, love your enemy, and to love the world, and to understand the profound responsibility in doing all of these things. Dr. King taught us that nonviolence is a way of life for courageous people. John Deere is certainly a most courageous advocate and activist for nonviolence principles. And join me in welcoming him uh, this evening. Thanks. everyone. Thank you so much, Paul, for that warm welcome. And uh, I want to thank uh, Melvin from the Multicultural Center for welcoming me, and Paul from the Center for Nonviolence and Peace Studies, and our friend from InterVarsity, and all of you for coming out in this bitter cold weather. Oh my gosh. And I was supposed to be here last week, but it got snowed in, so I'm happy to be here with you tonight. And if I don't say anything, all of it, I mean, for sure I want to just say Thank you, thank you, thank you for all you do for peace and justice, for practicing nonviolence, uh, for the peoples of the world, for creation, and for the God of peace and justice. I just want to encourage you to keep at it. Uh, and I'm so happy to be here because I was, as I said earlier today, heard a lot about your program here and the legacy of having Dr. Bernard Lafayette here, one of Dr. King's great colleagues. It was a great 
tribute to the university. Well, I'm in this microphone, and there's a microphone there, and do you see this thing here? I don't know if it works and all, but I'm reminded of the, yeah, I'm using the sad story of the young priest who's very nervous, as I feel right now in front of you holy peacemakers here in Rhode Island. And he comes up to the podium and he taps on the microphone and says, something's wrong with this microphone. And the congregation goes, and also with you. <laughs> I, it's about my best joke. So I, anyway, I hope that's not going to be the situation here with this microphone. And, and Paul and everybody, please just call, my, call me John because my name is so goofy, you know, D-E-A-R. Father dear just doesn't work. I always say Paul and Melvin asked me to speak, to reflect with you about our hero and teacher and exemplary Martin Luther King Jr. as part of Dr. King Week, and in light and particularly creative nonviolence. And um, as I said, I, I spoke a little bit earlier today. Sorry about the microphone there. And I always remember the the thing he said the night before he was killed. Remember in Memphis, he's in the big auditorium. And he said that famous speech, I've been to the mountaintop, I've looked over and seen the promised land, I may not get there with you, but we as a people will get there. And just before he said that, Dr. King said this, remember it. The choice is no longer violence or nonviolence, that's not what we're talking about. Well then what, Martin? It's nonviolence or non-existence. Unless we all become people of nonviolence in the whole planet, we're doomed. Go read the speech. And Gandhi said the same thing in the many, many, many times the last year of his life. Those are the last great words of our mighty prophet, peace and justice to us. And that's what we're seeing playing out now every day in the newspaper, rushing down toward non existence. But you and I are trying to wake up like he did and become people of nonviolence and teach it, practice it, and welcome a new world of nonviolence. Isn't that fantastic? So that gets me excited, and that's what I want to reflect with a little bit. So, you know, I wrote out a, just a little list, and you can just, I just invite you to ponder Dr. King for a second. Think of his life. So fantastic. Morehouse College, Crozier Seminary, Boston University, then he's he and Coretta moved to Montgomery, then Rosa Parks sits down, the boycott starts, he stands up, and he's uh, Jeremiah, speaking of nonviolence like no one had ever heard of before, and, and he's 26 years old, and he, you know, ends segregation in the buses, uh, he goes to India to study Gandhi, he moves to Atlanta, he joins the Ebenezer Church with his father. He forms the Southern Christian uh, Leadership Conference. And he starts using nonviolence as a methodology to confront racism and segregation in Albany, then Atlanta. Then he goes to Birmingham. Then he's arrested on Good Friday. He's in jail. He writes a spectacular testament, the letter of Birmingham jail. And it really marks the change of our country. Then organizes the March on Washington, gives the spectacular I Have a Dream speech. I'm just calling to mind his life, the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, the Nobel Peace Prize, marching from Selma to Montgomery, going to Watts to do nonviolence training there, moving to Chicago, figuring out what's the connection between Southern racism, Northern racism, economic justice, uh, and then he wrecks it all by saying, remember, justice is indivisible. That's the way he spoke. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. I can't be working for justice and equality here while my country is bombing children in Vietnam. And he was just targeted then. And then he's organizing the poor people's campaign to shut down Washington, D.C., the Capitol, and the Pentagon for justice for the poor and for peace. And so he's assassinated in Memphis. But I don't know if you, I'm kind of, Paul knows this, a, kind of a Dr. King fanatic. One of the great biographies tells the story, I don't know if you remember Paul or Melvin, around 1967, he's home alone 
in Atlanta, which was pretty rare, and he's working on the sermon the next day. Coretta's out with the kids. It's a Saturday afternoon. Comes a knock on the door, and it's his childhood friend who was in the third grade with, named Howard Baugh, who's a policeman. He's the first African-American policeman in the police force in Atlanta. They're old friends. And he, and he goes, oh, Martin, i, I got to talk to you. Oh, yeah, come on in. I'm home. This is a good time. And he says to him, what the heck are you doing? You're wrecking everything. You're supposed to be this, our hero of civil rights. We're working to end racism and segregation. Why are you speaking out against the war in Vietnam? And King says, you have never understood me. And you've known me since I was eight. I'm teaching us that we have to be nonviolent to the white people, building a nonviolent movement, and yet I'm going to support the bombing of little children in Vietnam, he says to this guy. When I say nonviolence, I mean, this was his exact words, nonviolence all the way. It's my whole life, and that's what I stand for. And in the biography, Burying the Cross by David Garrow, Howard Ball is just overwhelmed by this. And he says the first time he understood Dr. King. I think that's the situation in the United States. Very, very few people understand that Dr. King means nonviolence and nonviolence all the way. Not just no more racism or sexism, no more poverty or starvation, no more war. No more nuclear weapons. No more global warming. A whole new world of nonviolence. The beloved community. Isn't that fantastic? Well, you're looking at me like he's had too much coffee. But, or you're frozen solid, I'm not sure. Well, I want to just share, maybe I could share a little bit about some of my work. And I want to talk about Dr. King's creative nonviolence. A little bit about violence, nonviolence. And I've written out like five or six steps. And then we can discuss all of this, and resolve everything. How's that for a plan? I'm uh, 51 years old, and you heard my sad saga of the things that I've been doing. I was in college at Duke and decided to become a Jesuit and went to uh, Israel to see where Jesus lived. Total naive kid. I was 21 years old, very dopey. And the, week, the day I left, Israel invaded Lebanon and all the tourist groups were canceled. And I spent three months hitchhiking through Israel in the summer of 1982. You remember the summer war. I write about it. That's my autobiography of persistent peace. And I was camping out at the Sea of Galilee by myself for about 10 days, nobody around for miles, pondering the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the peacemakers. Offer no violent resistance to one who does evil. Love your enemies. Just then, I saw these huge black Israeli jets swoop down over the Sea of Galilee, where Jesus said, love your enemies, and drop a whole bunch of bombs and kill people 15 miles away on the border of Lebanon. It changed my life. I thought, oh, this stuff that Jesus talked about is serious. How do you do that? I turned to Dr. King and Gandhi and Dorothy Day and like you joined all the peace and justice groups. My journey, is, my journey of nonviolence and working for peace has taken me all over the world, war zones of the world, organizing demonstrations, teaching nonviolence, trying to practice it in every which way I can, speaking, writing, speaking to the media, politicians. But Gandhi says at some, some point you have to you do everything you can legally and then you cross the line and break the laws which legalize mass murder in your name. And so I got arrested at the Pentagon, and now I've been arrested regularly, and you hear I have a problem with recidivism, but that's a different topic. Uh, and uh, I've been living about these last eight years in New Mexico, poorest state in the country. Did you know that? Number one in poverty, number one in nuclear weapons, number one in military spending, number one in drunk driving, domestic violence, worst education system, on and on. It's like all there in the desert poverty. In the center, Los Alamos, birthplace of the nuclear bomb, where Barack Obama, our hero, I shouldn't be sarcastic, has spent more money on nuclear weapons than any president since Ronald Reagan in 1983. What he's done for nuclear weapons, George W. Bush couldn't even conceive of. 
He's completely re rebuilt Los Alamos. Billions and billions. Did you know that? It's incredible. Even as he's winning the Nobel Prize, and even as he incredibly said that speech in Prague, the future is a nuclear-free world. He's, it's like having it both ways. So we have a campaign there at uh, Los Alamos, trying to do a kind of Gandhian, Kingian, Satyagraha campaign. And we have every year on Hiroshima Day, hundreds of us gather there, sit in sackcloth and ashes, trying to experiment with this nonviolence, not to point fingers, but to say, this isn't working. Let's disarm and live in love and peace. But then, you know, uh, a couple of years ago when Barack Obama came to power, he's radically increased the war in Afghanistan, bombing children in Afghanistan and Pakistan, much, much more than uh, uh, Bush did. What do you do? Archbishop Tutu and I came up with a plan to go and meet, privately meet with President Obama. Tutu, who's a very funny guy, said, well, be good cop, bad cop. I'll be the good cop. You're the <laughs> Jesuit, so anyway, I'll let you. And we were going to talk to him about Afghanistan. Well, that was, at the very last minute, the White House canceled that. And I'm supposed to be a practitioner of this stuff. You know, we can't just study it. So what do you do? I went to Las Vegas, Nevada, a year and a half ago. Headquarters of the drones. It's the future of war. The unmanned aerial vehicles, they call them. And it was really shocking. Way out in the desert. Little tiny building, you know, like the size of this area right here, where they have 50 kids working at these, like, video game things. And we saw them up in the air. Huge black airplanes with no people in them flying around. What do they have? Uh, bombs gasoline, and cameras. They're loaded with cameras. And from the air, they fly off 10,000 miles. They can see faces in Afghanistan. And these kids make educated guesses and drop the bombs. And two reports came out last summer. One out of London, I think. Nine out of every 10 bombs that we are doing, talking about President Obama, kills civilians. Meanwhile, 850 children die every day of starvation in Afghanistan. We are breeding a whole new generation of terrorists. You can't stop terrorism through warfare, because war is terrorism. What do you do? We walked onto the base, 14 of us, knelt down. We brought roses and pizza and a letter. OK, we're not that sophisticated, Paul, but you do what you can. And uh, that didn't go over very well. And they arrested us and put us in change and threw us literally into, uh, into a big van, and they drove us downtown to Las Vegas, and we were put in a Las Vegas jail for about 24 hours. All I can say is it's a really creative way to see the Strip. <laughs> it was a whole new angle on Las Vegas. I'm trying to make this funny. It's not working. But. And then we were released, and we went back to the scene of the crime, their crime, the drones, with signs saying, don't bomb the children of Afghanistan. We don't want drones flying all over the planet. Since Obama has done this now, 44 nations on the planet are trying to set up huge drone programs. This is the future of the world. And all this violence is going to come back to us. So they, we, they had dropped the charges against us. And then last year, put full charges on us. And last fall, we had this full-blown trial where they were going to put me and my friends, there were 14 of us, in prison for six months. Um, what do you do? We get in there trying to say our peace, trying to practice the illegal, daring, provocative civil disobedience of our hero here. And the judge starts yelling at us right from the beginning, saying, you're not allowed to talk about anything, morality, Nuremberg principles, international law, uh, the drones. You can only talk about the violation of the trespassing law which you are charged with. Well, OK. We called as our first witness Ramsey Clark, the former attorney general under Kennedy and Johnson. I don't know if you know Ramsey, great guy. And we had other stellar people. This was like having Atticus Finch on the stand, you know, from To Kill a Mockingbird. He's about 90 years old, a man of great dignity. And, they, and we were questioning him, and the prosecutors questioned him. And Ramsey goes, <clears throat> well, what is trespassing? Well, I knew we won right there. I mean, that, 
Are you saying that if you're driving down a street and you see a house on fire and there's a child screaming from the top floor, you can't break in to save the life of the child because of a trespassing law? It seems to me that the death of a single child <clears throat> in order to uphold a trespassing law is poor public policy. Wow, you should have seen it. At the end of it, well, the judge tried to stop us from taking the stand because I would have launched into a big speech, as you see. And so we immediately cut to the chase and got to our closing argument. We weren't prepared for it. My friend Brian from the Catholic Worker in Iowa stands up, gives this impromptu speech in the court, which you can look up on the internet. Um, he's, and he's not allowed to mention anything. And he says, Your Honor, we're here talking about trespassing. We heard Ramsey Clark. We heard all these other great uh, experts. And uh, we remember Dr. King, and he's going on, and he says, your Honor, we are the people who hear the screams of the children of the world dying from our weapons, and we will not let a no trespassing law stop us. And he burst into tears. This packed courtroom burst into tears, and it was an incredible moment. I'm trying to follow through with Dr. King. The judge says, it was really something. It's like out of the movies. In fact, a play has been made. He says, <clears throat> well, there's, there's more going on here than just a trespassing law, I think. We're like, yeah. I need to go and think about this. So I need four months to go off and think, and then I'm going to come back with a verdict. I was like, well, I, I guess if someone says they're going to think, that's a good thing. Oh my gosh, in all my years, I've been in court hundreds and hundreds of times. I have like 15 lawyers. Well, you know, I'm an ex-con. I can never vote again. I'm monitored by the government. I, can never, I can't travel to a lot of countries because of my constant engagement with the law. Well, 10 days ago, we went back. And uh, of course, we were all found guilty, and he gave us time served. So what I'm trying to say is, I'm very happy to be here with you tonight. <laughs> I didn't tell Paul and Melvin this, but there was no way I was going to be here. I mean, then the snow came, but I was totally expecting to have a sabbatical to do further postdoctoral studies in the Las Vegas prison system. <laughs> I'm just trying to cheer us up, and it's not working too well. But Okay, if we're going to talk about Dr. King and creative nonviolence, let me just put it on the record, what we're dealing with. A world of total violence. That's Jonathan Schell's term. No, that doesn't get it. I think we're addicted to violence, like the alcoholic. You just can't stop drinking. So uh, the prophets in the Bible speak of two sides of types of violence. Poverty, which is the structured violence of corporate greed and empire that kills people. Well, three billion people on the planet don't have food, housing, health care, jobs, education, dignity. But that doesn't get it at all. I was totally devastated by the day Michael Jackson died. Who even heard this? The United States, United Nations held a press conference in Rome and said, well, we've been studying the statistics. Did you hear this, Melvin? It's official. There are over one billion people on the planet starving to death not hungry, about to die from starvation. It's totally ignored. That should be front page every day. We're talking about violence. And then you have the structured, institutionalized killing. So there's 35 wars happening tonight. Millions of people engaged in killing. Well, if you've got a world like that, think of any other type of violence you're all dealing with. Name anything. Racism, sexism, torture, prisons. On and on and on. Executions. But it, like the alcoholic who drinks and drinks, we crossed the line on August 6, 1945, when we as a people vaporized 80, 120,000 people at Hiroshima, 1945. And did it again three days later when we vaporized 80,000 people at Nagasaki. And today, 
there's 25,000 nuclear weapons. And I work hard at this. We, our groups in Santa Fe, we've been studying what's going on. Under Obama's leadership, we're building an entire new generation of nuclear weapons, despite his rhetoric. And there's probably 3,000 missing nuclear weapons on the planet. And you'll find different numbers and statistics, but this is what I come up with. A world of organized, legalized, uh, systemic killing. And I haven't even mentioned global warming that would allow the destruction of the planet like this. But, you know, coming from my tradition, from Dr. King's tradition, what's so shocking, you know, okay, you could say we're, we're addicted to violence. The violence is inside each of us now. We just think to be a human being is to fight back and be violent. We're so ingrained in killing and violence now that it's now, are you, are you ready? It's our spirituality. God is violent. Violence saves us. Might makes right. Nuclear weapons are our only protection, as the Archbishop of New Mexico recently told me. We can't do what Jesus said. That's all we've got. The good news is not love your enemies and reconcile with the planet, but we get to take everything for ourselves and be number one. And you may have to kill some people in the process. And this is God's will for us as a people. Uh, I'm trying to learn from Dr. King as he learned from Gandhi and his creative nonviolence to go farther. Because if you're going to really unpack it as a methodology and a spirituality, we have to name the predicament we're in. And King comes along. He's not spectacular. He's building on Gandhi. And he says, I don't know, I don't know how to, you can't paraphrase Dr. King, so I'm going to put it really stupidly because this is all I can, I can manage. Are you ready? <clears throat> Violence doesn't work. This is just not working. Violence in response to violence always leads to further violence. It's a never-ending downward spiral. As someone said long ago, you reap what you sow. The means are the end. What goes around comes around. War can't stop terrorism because war is terrorism. Um, and P war never brings you know, a beloved community or security or international solidarity. It just deepens the killing. If we're going to denounce or change the structures of war and poverty, we have to get also under the false spirituality of the lie of violence and say, and this is what gets me in trouble as a Jesuit. Buckle your seatbelts here. War is not the will of God. I think it's really a key thing. War is never blessed by God. I submit war is not endorsed by any major religion. War is never justified. War is the definition of mortal sin. I'm on a roll here. How, war is the demonic. It's anti-human, anti-community, anti-creation, anti-life, anti-God, anti-Christ. Go on and on. And this guy says, building on Gandhi, building on Jesus and Buddha, and our teachers like Dorothy Day, and all, peaceful means are the only way to a peaceful future and the God of peace. But he is just like Gandhi and uses this clumsy word from Hinduism, ahimsa, because the word peace and love, those words have so much baggage now, especially in the United States. Nonviolence. As I said today, talk about it. Define it. What does it mean for you? How do you practice nonviolence? How is your life journey? When you reflect on your own work for peace and justice, such an important question. How's your life been a journey from violence to nonviolence? Isn't that a great way to look at life? When I was writing my autobiography, I realized that's what happened to me. It's a journey from war, being a victim as a kid, of a culture of war and violence and family, to beginning to become a person of peace. And to make peace with myself, with my family and friends, to walk the road to peace, to a new future of peace and the God of peace. It's wonderful. Well, here's how I define it, and I, I'm building this on Dr. King's great rhetoric. Um, Nonviolence, if you will, begins with the vision, he called it the beloved community, a reconciled humanity, that all life is one, all life is sacred, that the gift of peace was already given to us. Billions of years ago. And if you can go deep into the spirituality of nonviolence, which he did, spirituality of peace and truth, you realize the good news. We're all one. 
We're all sisters and brothers. Every human being on the planet is your very sister and brother. All seven billion people. And the more you can go into the truth of reality, that we're all children, beloved children of the beloved God, and beloved sisters and brothers, you can never hurt another person ever again. They're equal as your blood brothers and sisters. Much less be silent and sit back and watch TV when there are 35 wars, a billion people starving to death, 25,000 nuclear weapons holding us on the brink of non-existence, and I haven't even mentioned global warming, how we're headed toward non-existence. So there's nothing passive about this. This is not a tactic. This is no longer a strategy. Dr. King is right. This is a way of life, but it's active, public, daring, provocative, pursuing the truth of our com the reality which is that we're all one, giving our lives for this truth, which means resisting violence in all its form, allowing God to disarm our hearts of the violence within us, and making us instruments of the God of peace, vision of peace, um, and practicing very consciously from this day forward unconditional, non-retaliatory, sacrificial, all-inclusive, universal love, universal love, nonviolent love for every human being on the planet. As I said today, with one catch, and it's a doozy. You all know this. And this is what he talked about all the time. It's totally politically incorrect in all peace and justice circles today. There is no cause, no matter what they tell us, however noble, whatever you think, for which we will ever accept the taking of a single human life. Oh, no, 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 no. We just get Hitler. No, we just get uh, Osama bin Laden. No, we'll get uh, Saddam Hussein. You know, if I just have that one last drink, I'll give it up. No, we're going to become sober. And so we're really, tonight is like a meeting of Violence Anonymous. And this is a 12-step group, and I'm the speaker, and I'm, hi, I'm John, I'm addicted to violence, and you say, hi. And I'm giving the rap, and then... We're all going to tell our stories of violence, and we are going to turn to our higher power because we're, we're helpless, and we're going to become sober people of nonviolence for the rest of our lives. It's really true. No, not only are we not going to kill, we are willing to give our lives to be killed. In his language, we are willing to accept suffering in pursuit of the truth of our common unity without a trace of the desire to retaliate with further violence. The violence ends here. Gandhi says this nonviolent stuff, and King gets it off him, is more powerful than all the weapons of the world combined because it's the way of God. If you can go deep within, it can be a spiritual explosion. So the point is, you're going to be nonviolent to yourself. Really, I, I, I'm friends with this great Buddhist teacher. He's been a great teacher of mine, Thich Nhat Hanh, and he says, you just, he, say, he says it so beautifully, just look deeply within. When you're driving down the street and you want to run over that, I mean, we're all for peace, of course, but there's someone we really want to get. Well, then just like look deeper, what's going on there? Why am I acting like this? How can I move on to be a little bit more nonviolent? Because it's not, it doesn't make you happy being violent inside. We want to cultivate interior nonviolence. We want to non-cooperate with our own violence toward ourselves. Be, non, be nonviolent to ourselves. Be nonviolent to your spouse, your children, your parents. You're going to be nonviolent to all your neighbors, nonviolent to your friends. Nonviolent toward everybody in Rhode Island, the university, You're going to be nonviolent toward everybody in the churches. It's going to be rough. I thought you'd laugh at that, but maybe things are worse here. Uh, anyway, a nonviolent toward everybody in the planet, and we're going to organize this, in Dr. King's word, as a methodology of social change that always, always, always works. It's just rarely tried. And that's what we've seen the last 30 years. Two thirds of the human race are involved in active grassroots nonviolent movements for social change, up to tonight in Cairo, which is predominantly a, a nonviolent movement. That's nonviolence, where people are sitting in the streets. Did you see the picture of the New York Times today? 
hundreds of them blocking the tanks. It's incredible. Well, if I could, if you're not totally, completely gone and bored, if I could just say a little aside about this. What I, after years of working at the Fellowship of Reconciliation, which is the largest interfaith peace group actually in the world that Gandhi and King were both active members of, I was the director, and I met thousands of religious activists, all the different religions, all over the world. And I'm studying, like you, nonviolence and Dr. King's creative nonviolence, but I learned from them. And again, we're trying to build on Dr. King. And I would invite you to ponder this, that nonviolence, contrary to what we're told, is at the heart of every major religion. Nonviolence at the heart. Maybe the future is interfaith nonviolence. Um, Islam means peace. I know hundreds of radical Muslims or radical people of total nonviolence. Judaism has that spectacular vision that I faced 20 years in prison for, they shall beat their swords into plowshares and never study war again. Incredible. Hinduism is like embodied in Gandhi. And the Buddhists, don't get me started on the Buddhists. Thich Nhat Hanh, he's saying, he's like this. <clears throat> We're going to be completely centered in the present moment of peace. So centered in mindfulness, because mindlessness leads to violence. But you only breathe in peace and breathing out peace. We're going to show compassion toward all sentient beings. And then he says, well, no, let's not stop there. Let's show compassion to the earth and the air and the sky. It's spectacular. But for just a second, I want to propose the possibility that even Christianity is about nonviolence. Now, this may be rough here, I realize, but you're very nonviolent people. This is the question for me. Was Jesus violent or nonviolent? And I hope our friend from InterVarsity can work on this here. If he's violent, I guess I don't want anything to do with him. But this theologian in the 1960s, learning from King, says, and building on Gandhi, it said, it's the only thing you can say for sure about Jesus, is that he's actively a person of creative nonviolence. Gandhi said, Jesus is the most active person of nonviolence in the history of the world. I just love that coming from the great Hindu. And then Gandhi goes on and says, and the only people on the whole planet who don't know that Jesus is nonviolent are Christian. <laughs> I could go on and on about this. I've written a lot of books about this because I'm trying to get Christians to be nonviolent. You know, I'm going, look at this guy. He's going, love one another, love your neighbor, be compassionate, hunger and thirst for justice, do unto others what you'd have them do unto you. Oh, blessed are the peacemakers. Take up the cross, lay down your life and love for humanity. And he says the most radical words ever, love your enemies. And there he's in the garden, and here come, he, he marches to Jerusalem, he does civil disobedience in the temple, doesn't hit anybody, hurt anybody, kill anybody, but he's not going to put up with injustice. Turns over the tables and teaches them nonviolence. And they torture him, arrest him, and kill him. He's in the garden of Gethsemane, you know, and the Roman soldiers come. Adam, and that's a critical moment for me because as I go around the country, I'm talking to hundreds of thousands of churchgoers about nonviolence and Dr. King and Jesus. And they're I remember this one sweet Catholic lady said to me, well, Father John, this is really interesting stuff. I, and I think that nonviolence thing is very intriguing. But sometimes you just got to kill somebody. <laughs> well, how did we get from... Jesus to Dr. King to kill. Then go in the Garden of Gethsemane. Here come the Roman soldiers. What does St. Peter do? Peter's going, excuse me, Jesus, I'm in charge here. And he's thinking, if violence is ever justified, if violence is ever going to work, if there was ever a just war theory in all of salvation history, this is the moment. Protect our guy. He takes out the sword to kill the Roman soldier. And just as he takes up the sword, the commandment comes down. Put down the sword. Remember? It's the end of the gospel. And it's the first time Peter and the gang understood who this Jesus is. Oh my God, it's nuts. Is so serious about this nonviolence agape, he's not even going to defend himself with violence, which means we don't get to defend ourselves with violence, and they run away, leave him alone. And read Dr. I mean, I, I learned my faith from Dr. King, who learned his faith from Gandhi. 
who wrote, Mahatma Gandhi wrote, that the greatest expression of nonviolence was Jesus on the cross being executed, saying, the violence stops here. You're all forgiven. You're not allowed to kill. God raised from the dead, and he says, peace be with you. Now you walk the road of nonviolence. Powerful stuff. When I think of Dr. King and, and my own experience, I maybe I, I'll just come up with these maybe six points, and then I can open it up for you, uh, about the life and action and theory and practice of creative nonviolence. But I hope all of you here have gone over to Paul's Center for Nonviolence and Peace Studies. He does these great trainings on nonviolence, the workshops every summer. See him afterwards. If you haven't, learn the methodology and practice. But these are some of my what I've picked up from Dr. King. Okay, first of all, if you're going to do this, you have to be, how do I describe it? A contemplative of peace and nonviolence. I think Dr. King was. He came from a Baptist tradition. If I look at Gandhi, I look at Thomas Merton, Dorothy Day, our Tutu, our great teachers. They're fundamentally mystics of revolutionary nonviolence, but mystics. And I'm trying to talk about the violence within. And, the re and they take time to meditate, I would call it, in very simple, quiet time, solitude, to enter into peace and to dwell in peace. And the reason nobody likes to do that anymore is because the minute you go into prayer or meditation, whatever you call it, contemplation, all your junk comes up. And you don't like to sit with yourself because we're all so violent. We're addicted. And you're like, hey, I got, I'm a busy, important person. I got to get out of here. Or, I, you know, or like, I really hate my mother or that kid in the fifth grade or the president or the pope or somebody. We hate somebody. That's the good stuff. That's the stuff to pray over, to look deeply at the violence within. And friends, if I, st I study Dr. King, I say, if you want to be a person of peace and nonviolence, you have to let go of your violence, your anger, your hurts, your wounds, your bitterness, your rejection, all, all of that, all of that. Give it to your image of the God of peace. And let the God of peace give you the gift of peace. That like Dr. King, we can radiate personally the peace we seek politically. That we can be mystics, a new kind of holiness like him. That your mere presence is a threat to the empire because we're so disarming and we're no longer afraid. Because what happens, I'm speaking now as a Christian, but you get to know God. And the culture is saying God is a God of war, a God who blesses injustice, a God of vengeance, a mean old white guy who can't wait to throw you in hell, or at least let's hope them. And that's not it at all. God is the God of peace and nonviolence. The scandal of Christianity is that God is nonviolent. So how do you, I'm talking about integrate your spirituality with the nonviolence of Dr. King. Is your God nonviolent? Do you worship a God of peace? This was a very important question for Gandhi and Dr. King. How does faith interact with the peace and justice movement? Secondly, we have to be people of meticulous personal and interpersonal nonviolence. And God, Dr. King was and Gandhi was, and we could investigate them, you know, down to every moment of their daily lives, and that may be good. But how about ourselves? Really being nonviolent toward ourselves, our family members, our coworkers, everybody we meet. And that's really hard work, I find. And it means there's learning tricks to do that and to be very mindful and attentive. Third, I'd say we all have to be students and teachers of creative nonviolence. Study the methodologies, and then teach it and use the word in your workplace, in your churches. That's why I like this university as a center for peace and nonviolence. Um, my thought at the university I've been talking with Paul is that's the whole point. It should be a training camp, a school of nonviolence. Certainly any Christian school should be in the United States or anywhere in the world. Any institution that's trying to help people should be nonviolent and teaching people how to be nonviolent. How are you a student and a teacher of nonviolence? Very important. Fourth, I would say we all have to be activists of nonviolence. I knew this great, you know, the great uh, leader, the farm workers, Cesar Chavez. And once I said to him, if I'm talking about nonviolence and people say, what should we do? I said, what should I say? And he said, without missing a beat, he went like this. Tell everybody, 
Public action, public action, public action. That sounds like Dr. King. Get involved. Do something publicly and actively to engage, experiment with nonviolence. Well, many of you may have been activists, and that's great, and I invite you to reflect on what you've done and how does what sustains you and how can you continue. But for the rest of us, I would say pick one issue, one cause, and get involved. Uh, you know, I like what Romero said, nobody can do everything, but everybody can do something. Uh, fifth, I would say, I got one other one after that, is to be, this is really Dr. King's creative nonviolence, because he is to be prophets of nonviolence. So I'm activists, teachers, you know, contemplatives, personal, interpersonal nonviolence, but a p prophetic people in the sense of speaking out in the name of truth or the God of peace, the good news of peace and nonviolence, and that means denouncing injustice. So what would Dr. King say? Well, we've heard all of the things he said. What would he be saying today? Here's my little list. Uh, buckle your seatbelt. This is the kind of thing I imagine that we, as people of creative nonviolence, who are trying to carry on his legacy, should be saying in Rhode Island and around the country. In the name of peace, in the name of the God of peace, Tonight, stop the evil wars in Iraq, Pakistan, Afghanistan. Bring the troops home. Let the UN resolve the crisis nonviolently. Make massive reparations. Stop the militarization of the Middle East and all military aid to Israel to, so we can stop the occupation of the Palestinians and support nonviolent Israeli peacemakers and Palestinian peacemakers and lift up the Jewish vision of Shalom. Welcome every immigrant to the country. Support the undocumented. Stop US military aid to Colombia and all the wars around the world. Close the terrorist training camp in Georgia, the School of the Americas. In fact, close the 125 other terrorist training camps. And close the 740 military bases around the planet. And while you're at it, close Los Alamos and just close the Pentagon and the CIA and the NSA. Close them. Leave the World Trade Organization. Lift the entire third world debt. House the world's homeless. Give away free medicine to anyone with AIDS and HIV. In fact, just give away free universal health care. Abolish the death penalty. Undertake treaties for total nuclear disarmament. Join the world court. Obey international law. Sign the Kyoto Accords, find alternatives to fossil fuels, stop global warming, end the Star Wars budget, a program, cut the entire military budget, abolish the 25,000 nuclear weapons to every handgun, and then take the billions and billions and hundreds of billions of dollars and feed every starving child and refugee on the planet this weekend and with the infinite money left over begin the healing process, and educate every person on the planet in Dr. King's methodology of nonviolence. What do you think of that? That's what we've got to be saying. My last point is just, when, when I think of Dr. King, I, you know, standing there at the Lincoln Memorial, gosh, I know there's so many other speeches I think were more important. When he's saying, I have a dream, we have to be like this dreamer. Visionaries of creative nonviolence. One of the casualties of a culture of war, addicted to violence, where it's legal to have 25,000 nuclear weapons. It's legal to allow catastrophic climate change to be upon us. This is perfectly legal. A billion people to starve death, totally legal. One of the casualties of this sick, sick, sick culture is the loss of the imagination. You walk down Providence and you could say, can you imagine we're going to abolish all war and nuclear weapons? They're going to say, what our drug are you on? What have you been drinking? They can't even imagine it. I, as I, today, I, I spoke of my heroes, and they have a long history in New England, the abolitionists. That's what they did. Imagine these incredible people 200 years ago saying, this is my imitation of them, excuse me, United States, we are announcing the abolition of slavery. And you read their lives. They, they, people laughed at them and said, are you insane? There's always been slavery. It's in the Bible. Some people aren't people. And they said, no. A new world is coming. A new world of equality, a multicultural world, to put it simply, 
And they lifted up this vision that was impossible. And they gave their lives for it. Friends, we are their ancestors in our work for peace and justice. We're new abolitionists. We're going beyond our hero. And we're going to stand up and say, excuse me, Rhode Island. Excuse me, Mr. Obama and the United States. We are announcing the abolition of war and poverty and starvation and executions and nuclear weapons and global warming. And I talk this all this way and people say, well, you're totally insane. I say, no, a new world is coming, a new world of nonviolence. Gandhi and Dr. King lifted up that vision and gave us vision and gave us hope. Jesus called that the reign of God at that point. This is what we're trying to do. This is what our teacher taught us. This is the most important thing we can do for the rest of our lives. I thank you for all you've done for peace and justice, for being people of nonviolence, and I urge us all to go forward and do what we can to welcome a new world of nonviolence. Thanks for listening to me, everybody. Well, if it's okay, Paul, we'll have a little bit of time for question and answer. Paul said we have time for rebuttal. That was a joke, too, but my jokes aren't going over. Melvin, you want to start us off? Okay. Melvin Wade, the director of the Multicultural Center, real loud so everyone can hear you. Well, now we didn't want to bring all that up. <laughs> Did you know Mary Lou, or do you know of her? She was a jazz pianist. Well, you know, thank you. Uh, that's in my book, my autobiography. I went to Duke University in the 70s. Well, I think, though, just to cut to the chase, Melvin, like yourself, I've had incredible teachers in my life. And at some point, I realized, uh, like the East, under Hinduism, Buddhism, that whole religious tradition is you go and find a guru. A teacher, that's what they call Jesus. You're a disciple means student, and you sit at the feet. And we don't have that in the United States anymore. And so then, when I, after my, those experiences, I went and sought those people out. And you can read, I'm a, as you see, I'm a big name dropper. I mentioned Jesus at the drop of a hat. No. I, I, after my experience at Duke, and once I entered the Jesuits, I thought, well, who are the greatest people in the world? I'm going to go and meet them and sit at their feet and learn the lesson. And I did. I met everybody. And uh, I'm still on that journey to learn. But, you know, I, I did have an incredible experience at Duke University. And I was going through a great turmoil. I was, grew up in a wealthy Catholic family from D.C. and North Carolina. Went to Duke. Uh, decided I was so appalled by the Catholic Church. I was going to leave that. But to be on campus, you have to be a wild fraternity kid. And then I thought, well, if you're going to leave the church, you might as well forget God. That's ridiculous. So that's a good idea. And I'm just going to be as wild and crazy as I could. And I found that made me very unhappy. You know, spiritually, it leads to desolation. You know, it's nearness. You're choosing nihilism and violence. And I was seeing the social, economic, and political implications of my spiritual choice. I was feeling it, but I knew that, well, if there is no God, and I'm not going to be part of a community of love, why the hell not make as much money as you want and bomb whoever you want? Because there's no meaning. And I, I, uh, I found Viktor Frankl's book about the concentration camps and man's search for meaning to be very powerful. Well, at this, in this moment, I'm studying with um, Professor Chafee. He's not named after this building, but he was a historian of the civil rights movement in the 70s. And other, I, my, I majored in African American history at Duke in the 70s. And, me, and meanwhile, my plan was to be uh, 
a newspaper publisher like my father, a lawyer, or a rock star. I was really hoping for the last. And uh, I was good. I could play the piano and the guitar. I had bands. I was going to recording studios. And I was really serious. I was going to New York. And then on campus, there's this incredible historic figure. Now, you, maybe most of you don't know her. Her name was Mary Lou Williams. And she was in her 80s then. And she was the most famous woman jazz pianist in our country's history. Uh, so she had a teacher in residence kind of thing. And I went up to see her and said, would you teach me how to play jazz? And I was so bold. And she said, OK. So I used to go to her house, and I hung out with her a lot. I never met anybody like her. She, she, she. Later, I found out, you know, she's doing concerts for Dr. King and Dorothy Day, and she is going to daily mass and doing jazz concerts in the evening. I'm going, what? And she's trying to break all the barriers, and she says, "I'm using music to teach love." And she was just probably the biggest heart I've ever encountered, like Mother Teresa. And you know, it was great to be in her presence. And it was very peculiar because then I had this, my conversion. One day I decided this isn't working. I, I do believe in God. And then I thought, i got to give my whole life to God. And I thought, oh my God, I'm going to have to become a Jesuit. And I started volunteering at the Duke Hospital. And Mary Lou got cancer really bad. She's in the hospital. And so I was with her up through her death as a 20-year-old kid. And then I graduate and go off to Israel and I see the bombers swoop down over the Sea of Galilee and kill people at the place where he said love even your enemies. And that set me off on a journey you know to get to know people. You were talking like Mrs. King to Mother Teresa to Archbishop Tutu to Berrigans, my great teachers. And there's a lot of great people and any young people here, I urge you use your time wisely at the university. Get to know Melvin Wade and Paul over here. And uh, that's what I did. Learn, really learn about how to live and how can we make a better world. Yeah. Or who, somebody else had a comment or a question. Yeah. Real loud. How do you deal with them? Nonviolently. You can't fight fire with fire. You have to fight fire with water. People need to be disarmed. And the lesson, if I can be panoramic, of the 60s is we're all mean, bitter activists for peace. You know, it doesn't work. It didn't sustain you. Whereas Dr. King is really coming at it from a different way. Actually, you could go really deep and say Gandhi is saying nonviolence is an ontological thing. It begins with your being. Only when your interior is unified can you then step forward and have an effect on a person like that or the world. And Gandhi and King, I think, proved that personally because I think, I think they achieved the kind of nonviolent heart that Jesus and Buddha call us to. So <clears throat> there's no way, if you're talking about somebody doing violence to me, I mean, I think, the whole, I, I think I'm like living in an insane asylum in the United States. I think we're all insane with violence. We want to bomb and kill people all over. I, where I live on a mountain near Santa Fe, I look out at Los Alamos, and 20,000 people, more millionaires than any place on the planet, more PhDs than any place on the planet, spend all their energies building weapons to vaporize millions of people. They're actually, the race is on to find the, next, the thing after the nuclear bomb. I mean, I could really scare you with it. I've been studying what they're actually doing. So those people frighten me. Our politicians frighten me. They're the mass murderers, you know. The I don't, and when I thought of Tucson, and I've been there many times and spoken to huge crowds on nonviolence there, I, I think, I don't know why that doesn't happen every five minutes in the United States. It's a miracle that we're as nonviolent as we are. But if you're talking about meeting somebody like that and you, who's going to challenge you or threaten you, there's no way you're going to, if your first instinct is going to be nonviolent, unless you're doing your work. That's why you've got a chain in nonviolence, like Paul does these workshops. 
You've got to study it. Ponder Dr. King. Get with a little peace group. Do your prayer work. Work on disarming your heart and figure out, well, okay, how do I nonviolently intervene? How do I disarm somebody? Now, a lot of my personal journey with you when I was a kid was I thought, I have to put myself in the most violent places because I've done all my homework, but I don't know how to do this. So I went right into the worst war zone of El Salvador to live under the direction of the Jesuits who were later assassinated. It's a powerful thing to have known, incredible martyrs. And, you know, when the death squads came through, the theory was we'll send out me and another young white gringo Jesuit, and hopefully they'll kill them, not us. That's what the refugees were. So I had to learn your stuff real quick, because I met the Salvadoran death squads in 1985, and they had machine guns aimed at me. And, I, and what do you do? I'm like... Hi, how are you? I'm John. Can I help you? You need anything? What's that thing you got there? And you be humorous, and you be nonviolent, and you be disarming. And I didn't use the word enough, but what Dr. King said is that nonviolence is infinitely creative. Or violence is always the same old, just kill them. And it's just the infinite spiral that goes on and on. I, I can go on at length about this. I've written about this in there have been many great books about, you know, uh, intervening with somebody threatening to do violence or somebody who's gone insane like the kid in Tucson. I mean, that's a societal question that uh, we, we allow young people to go so crazy. I mean, he needed so much help. Um, we should be, every school, every city should be training all our young people in nonviolence. But well, why, why, I mean, I, if you're all for violence, we're all for violence. Well, why shouldn't we just massacre people? We're doing that in Afghanistan. We're doing it in Iraq. You got a billion people starving to death. Are they any different from Tucson? How much do you want to know about Tucson? Did you know that there are 850 unnamed bodies in the morgue about a mile from that shop, Safeway Shopping Center of immigrants who were found in the desert? Last year, I spent a week walking illegally on the border with a group of friends who broke the law. It's incredible countryside. Leaving um, maybe 40 gallons, one each individual gallons of water under certain secret cactus, uh, where the, the, there's about 1,000 people who cross that section of the border south of Tucson every night. And they, they have about, I don't know if it's 50, 100 people die every year in that in the desert. Uh, Oh, we're all one. Everybody's got to be taught. I don't know if this gets to what you're asking about, but something like that. Uh, always, always, always respond to everybody with every situation through active, creative nonviolence. And I submit, King says, nonviolence work is just rarely tried. What would you do with that? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. all the time, and I've been in Iraq, and I've been all around the world, and we're all up to our ears in the military, and my message is always, don't join the military. Quit the military. Don't get killed, and don't kill anybody. We can do better than that. And the military solution's not working. 100 million people killed from war in the last century, and we're leading toward the brink of total non-existence. This isn't working. And Gandhi and King propose a methodology to resolve international conflict that actually works. You heard that I lived in Northern Ireland. I was there. I saw how the Good Friday Peace Agreement worked. It's ending the troubles in Northern Ireland. And Clinton is over there saying, bombing doesn't work. 
Terrorism is not the answer. And I was said to him, well, well, now let's apply that to the whole world. Stop bombing Iraq. Anyway, uh, well, with these questions, I mean, in that scenario, and when I was in Iraq, I always tell everybody to quit. And you can read the, what, the climax of my book was one day in my parish in the desert of New Mexico, I woke up and the entire National Guard unit the battalion for northeastern New Mexico was marching. I lived in a three-block town, was marching around my block with the church, the big old church. I live in a goofy old rectory, 100-year-old building, in the middle of the desert. And they're at 6 a.m. They're shouting and chanting these 75 young soldiers leaving for Iraq the following week. They're, they're fighting. So swing your gun from left to right. We can kill those guys. And I woke up the whole town, and I thought, Oh, they're just trying to get support as they go over to kill. No! They were trying to get me. And after an hour of marching around the town, the whole I, I looked out the window, and all 75 soldiers were right up to my front door, shouting the battalion slogan, one bullet, one kill. And it sounded like, kill, kill, kill. This is the future of our country. I mean, having a, a unit of our military march on the home of a private citizen, not just the pastor of the local... This is like you'd expect this under Mubarak or Pinochet. Michael Moore called me and was going to put me in this, his office, was going to put me in this movie he was making, Fahrenheit 9-11. What do you do? I walked out into the street. I thought I was going to be killed. And it turns out that the, the uh, heads of the guard had or, had organized all their young people to come and get me for speaking out for peace. And I launched into a big speech. I said, excuse me, in the name of the God of peace, don't go to Iraq. Disobey orders. Don't get on that plane. You don't have to kill. I don't want you to kill. I don't want you to be killed. You're not meant to kill. We're called to be nonviolent. And by the way, God wants you, Jesus says, to love our enemies, to love the people of Iraq, our sisters and brothers. And waging war is not the way to peace. And you don't want to kill one baby. So go home. God bless you. And they all looked at me like, and then they burst out laughing. So, and that's been my whole life is telling people not to do that. And I could tell you stories of intervening as well. If you just real quickly, so if come, you're, you're saying, well, what about, you know, I used to get this, what about someone's got a gun and they're going to attack your grandmother? So here's my grandmother. I'm here. Here they come with a gun. Well, wouldn't you shoot them? Well, no, because I don't have a gun. Uh, and if I did, that's not going to work. He's going to shoot first and kill us both. So we're going to be nonviolent and we're going to say, what's the matter? Put down the gun. Here you want some food. What happened? And he's going to burst into tears because I'm going to treat him like a human being. I'm going to, I'm going to make food and we're going to become best friends. I thought you might laugh at that or say, oh, that's right. Of course, John. Uh, my grandmother, though, lived, you know, in Bethesda, Maryland, and she lived to be 90 and she never had any problems. And see, the scenario that I'm arguing, now I'm coming as a Christian, is I got my grandmother, I got me, I got the guy who's sick in violence, and I'm going to use a nonviolent mean creativity to disarm the person. But I'm arguing there's a fourth person in the scenario. You're not going to like this, but I'm just going to say it. For me, the God of peace, who says, I have structured the world to do this so that you can all live in peace. The problem with that scenario is that three miles away, there were 25,000 people in suits planning mass murder. It's in this horrible, evil building called the Pentagon. And nobody is intervening there. And I look out the window, I see at Los Alamos, they're doing it. And you have a place right around the street called Groton, where they're planning the end of the planet at the Trident submarine, where I've been arrested many times there. Uh, where do you have it in Rhode Island? Okay, so those places, I mean, you have to train to respond instinctively nonviolent, but those other places need to be intervened as well. Well, I wonder if we've resolved everything. You've all been very, very nonviolent. Should we just end there? And I'm, I'm really grateful to be here with you, happy to sign books and meet with you afterwards. And I just encourage you, just encourage you to keep pursuing this vision and practice of Dr. King's nonviolence. And... Uh, Carry on. You're doing great. All the best. God bless you. Thank you.
Half of the center, we have a small presentation, and and helping us will be some of the uh, members of the Center for Nonviolence and Peace Studies who have recently completed our training programs there last year and this past summer, and who are helping us do some of the trainings that we're doing there now. So, and uh, Professor Art Stein will come and help with a small presentation. And Geshe Dupton Tindar, um, who's joined our center, uh, Tibetan Buddhist, will also come. So, uh, uh, John, the Center for Nonviolence and Peace Studies at the university recognizes you as an honorary Kingian nonviolence activist. We know you're a nonviolence activist, but now we're making you a Kingian nonviolence activist. You, you have the training booklet now, so. It, uh, for his commitment to peace, to end war, and to the elimination of nuclear weapons of mass destruction uh, February 9th, uh, on behalf of our city. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, uh, Geshe Tupton Tindar has something in the, I believe it's in the center, he'd like to present to you. Michaela Cashman and uh, the student training. Father John would like to say on the behalf of the Student Nonviolence Involvement Committee that we found your speech tonight both inspirational and uplifting and would like to present you with this shirt from our center as a thank you. getting all these nice gifts.